So a warm welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar on feminist realities, transforming democracy in times of crisis. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Lavinia Steinfort from the Transnational Institute, and I'm speaking to you from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So for today's eighth webinar in our weekly COVID capitalism webinar series, we're joined by four great speakers, uh, Titi Bhattacharya, Avino Okech, Cara Jabola Carolis, and Laura Roth. Um, and Silvia Federici was originally also one of our speakers, but because of personal circumstances, she unfortunately recently had to cancel. Uh, we'll miss her presence very much, of course. We're also very honored to have this inspiring global panel of feminist thinkers and activists to discuss how we can collectively reorganize and build the feminist powers needed to get out of the worsening health, climate and capitalist crisis, which impacts the most marginalized groups in the so-called global south the hardest. So the responses to the pandemic show how neoliberal, authoritarian and fundamentalist politics consolidate and sometimes collide to further attack the rights of women, migrants, informal workers, people of color, indigenous communities, trans and non-binary persons, among many, many others. So how do the numerous injustices that the pandemic exacerbate relate to corporate power and global labor hierarchies that are highly gendered and racialized. How have elite and reactionary powers transformed, limited and predetermined our understanding and practice of democracy. This pandemic also indicates how a window of opportunity for social labor and environmental justice movements um, can join forces and really organize the wider population in order to shift power on an unprecedented scale. Luckily, we're witnessing, we're witnessing across the globe widespread solidarity initiatives and deep community organizing because while being on the front lines of COVID-19, those who identify as women, fem femme and non-binary have long been imagining and building transformative feminist realities. So which practices and measures are already being deployed to build radical democratic systems that genuinely care for the environment and our collective well-being? These and other questions will be addressed by our great feminist panelists who have years of experience with analyzing and challenging the state of power while simultaneously working hard to build and deepen participatory democracies so that the 99% and in particular those most oppressed folks can be in the driving seat because only this can foster the just and equitable societies in which every living being can flourish. So this webinar is brought to you by the Transnational Institute and the amazing, oh, sorry, one second, something goes wrong with my um, screen. So I wanted to say, uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Transnational Institute and the amazing Association of Women's Rights and Development, AWEED. We're also very happy that this webinar is being co-sponsored by Focus on the Global South, Alternative Information and Development Center in South Africa and Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, also known as DAWN. And thank you for all those tuning in. I want to extend a particular thank you to the comrades who are doing the translating work because it's really hard to do simultaneous translation. So thank you very much. Um, you know, to answer your question, Lavinia, um, when I kind of think back on this, if when I will think back on this crisis in the years to come, I think two images will stay with me. One is the image of Palestinian farmers leaving free food uh, vegetables by the roadside for hungry people to take. Um, and the other is uh, that of the Indian police hosing down immigrant migrant workers with bleach um, in order to stop the pandemic. So these two images um, embody for me um, two kinds of responses in this pandemic. 
one that by Palestinian uh, farmers is the response of ordinary people to the pandemic, which is doing um, sustaining, life-making, life-saving uh, activities. And the other is the response of governments and states to the pandemic, which is carceral um, ways to manage the crisis. So in the midst of this pandemic that is killing thousands, I want to actually talk here about a far more dangerous killer, one that we can actually thank for bringing us to this crisis. And here I'm talking about capitalism. We now know that factory farming was actually part of the reason for the origins of this virus. We also know how the system has responded to this virus, which is prioritizing what it has always prioritized, profits over life. So today, I want to talk about the fate of life and life making under capitalism in general, but under this pandemic in particular. While capitalism as a system only cares about profit, profit being the system's lifeblood and motor, the system actually has a relation of reluctant dependence on processes and institutions of life making. What does that mean? It means capitalism is dependent on workers to produce dead things, which are commodities, which are then sold to make profits. So the system can only survive if workers' lives are reproduced continuously and reliably while being replaced generationally. So food, housing, public transport, public schools and hospitals are all ingredients of life making that socially reproduce workers and their families. The level of access to these life making processes often determine the fate of working people as a whole. And of course, women still perform the bulk of life making work globally. So this is the dependence that capitalism has on life making, but it is a reluctant dependence because capitalism is reluctant to spend any portion of its profits on processes that sustain and maintain life. This is why all care work is devalued or underpaid or unpaid under capitalism while institutions of life making such as schools and hospitals are either constantly privatized or underfunded. So feminists do not really need reminding how our world before COVID was already a ravaged world when it came to gender. Care work in the home, as we know, is still mostly performed by women. Women's unpaid labor in the home is worth 10 trillion dollars globally. Professions which embody the spirit of care work, such as teaching, nursing, home care, of course employ large numbers of women. <coughs> if capitalism as a system is about the production of dead things or commodities, these services and infrastructures schools, hospitals, public transport, are vital to the production of people or life. But they do not just reproduce lives. They actually build capacities and attributes essential to the human condition. So into this world of unequal wages, unremunerated labor, and unmitigated gender violence came COVID-19. One would think that since this was a public health crisis, our rulers would finally pay attention to, oh, I don't know, public health. And to a certain extent, they did. New temporary field hospitals were created to care for the sick. Normally, draconian immigration laws were somewhat relaxed, again, temporarily, while posh hotels were commandeered to house the homeless. So had capitalism suddenly turned caring? Well, the answer is a resounding no. And how can we prove that? Well, we can prove that in the 
hundreds and thousands of deaths that has happened, but in actually in more systemic ways as well. Around the world, if we follow the history of what happened and how governments responded when they first learned of the virus, we will see that governments only started to respond to the virus once its spread was already impossible to control by their respective medical infrastructures. So now we are finding out from various sources that governments and scientists have been warning of this for years to come and governments had um, at the insistence of big pharmaceutical companies had basically said, you know, this is not a priority. We, we will figure this out some other times. By the way, let's make more money selling uh, uh, drugs and uh, uh, building for profit healthcare systems. So it has been instructive in a way to see how stubbornly capitalism refused to protect life while panicking over stocks. By the way, the United States, where I live now, leads the world in prioritizing death-making over life-making. In addition to leading the world in militarism, which is directly killing people, especially of the global south, the United States is a society which has its priorities very clearly marked. It is a society with 2.7 hospital beds per 1,000 people and 120 guns per 100 civilians. What the pandemic has done then is tragically revealed what we feminists knew all along, that the life-making work of care performed mostly by women, such as food production, nursing, cleaning, teaching, is what actually sustains society. This is why capitalism had to admit during this crisis of public health that nurses and farm workers, not stockbrokers and CEOs, were what they called essential workers. In other words, the work of women and gender nonconformist people actually makes all other work possible. So you think finally women would be rewarded for getting society through the pandemic. In the United States, women represent 60% of those laid off in the pandemic. Nurses all over the world have had to work without PPE or personal protective equipment. In the United States, you know, the heart of empire, where you know it's supposed to be one of the richest countries of the world where our um, president is um, giving sound medical advice to drink bleach uh, to stave off uh, COVID-19 where you know some of the top billionaires of the world live in this place nurses have had to wear garbage bags and swim goggles as PPE in order to go into work. And of course, the death rate is disproportionately skewed in the United States towards people of color. So in Italy, immigrant women are being airlifted to work on Italian farms with no regard for social distancing rules. Meanwhile, domestic violence is on the rise everywhere due to women being forced to stay home with known abusive partners and family members. And through this, instead of opening up more hospitals, more childcare centers for essential workers, more resources to provide food to starving millions, what are the governments keen to open up? The economy. This is how we know that for capitalism, the priority is still thing making and not life making. Indeed, it is now actively endangering life by opening up the economy, workplaces, and schools where people now have to decide whether they can afford life, which is keeping, which is about staying home safely, or they can afford a wage for which they have to go to work. Okay, so this has now become a stark struggle between the wage and life. And so this means that in the United States, wages are tied to uh, 
uh, to healthcare. So this also means that when people decide not to go to work, they might lose their jobs, which also means they'll lose healthcare. This is why, as feminists, we cannot go back to business as usual once the pandemic crisis passes. We must demand that instead of capitalism putting our lives in crisis, we need to put its dynamic of profit making over life making into crisis. This, the, the seeds of how to do this is apparent all around us. So for instance, through this crisis, we have seen ordinary people respond in the most solidaristic manner towards uh, their fellow humans. Mutual aid networks has sprung up. Uh, people are taking food over to strangers. Um, teachers are driving or uh, walking past their students' houses simply to say hello, um, you know, at a social distance. Um, in in India, for um, in uh, the, my state where I come from, Bengal, a cyclone has devastated um, the entire region, and uh, people have lost lives. But again, networks of support and solidarity, not coming from the government, but coming from ordinary people, have sprung up to help during this crisis. And a lot of these networks are women-led. Okay. So what we can say for sure is that we need to demand coming out of this crisis that life and life making become the basis of social organization. That we cannot go back to where we maintain this uh, mad and blind drive to ecological devastation and gender violence that profit making creates. We need to go back and say that we need to prioritize life making to the flourishing of the many rather than the prosperity of the few. Thanks. Thank you so much, Titi. That was great. Um, Jess, that's, thank you for the next slide. Uh, there we go. So um, it was really good to have that bigger picture of you, Titi. And let me now introduce our next speaker. Dr. Avino Okech uh, is a lecturer at the Center for Gender Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, University of London. She brings over 12 years of social justice transformation work in Eastern Africa, the Great Lakes region, and South Africa to her teaching, research, and movement support work. We're very grateful for your participation, Avino, in these super challenging times. So can I ask you, um, how has the rise and collisions of fascisms, fundamentalisms and capitalism transformed, limited and predetermined our understanding and practices of democracy and governance? Um, and in relation to your many writings on gender, state and society in African countries, what is the state of the state in this moment of crisis? And looking forward, how is this changing? And finally, it would be great to hear, given the range of state responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, can you also say a bit about the underlying social contracts? So over to you, Avino. Thank you very much, Lavinia. And I'm really going to be building a lot on what TT has already, uh, you know, sort of laid out for us. I think uh, there are three central points that I want to make in, uh, in speaking to the questions that you have raised. And the first, of course, is that this pandemic has exposed in a rather dramatic way what many of us already knew for a long time, which is that we live in a world that, uh, you know, shaped by inequalities that are really underwritten by racialized logics that are always mapped onto class and gender. So for many of us, what we are aware of is that the chickens are coming home to roost. The historical theft of resources and the gutting of countries through economic restructuring processes is now all evident for all of us globally to see. So whether you're in the left, the right, the center, you can sort of manipulate your responses to lockdowns and curfews and how governments are dealing with this particular situation, but it cannot escape us that we uh, are facing a very particular challenge that is deeply connected to the ways in which our societies are structured. Now, perhaps for those in the global north, these realities have become 
uh, much more stark in the last five years, particularly with the overt political mobilization of fascist movements across Europe, US, and sections of Latin America, and their ascent to power. Because the point is that these movements have existed for a very long time, but what we are observing right now, people are running for office, are in parliaments, are sitting in the EU, so there's a very active and overt political mobilization. But for those of us who are from the global south, specifically from the African continent, we have always been aware of the collusion between the political elite, uh, our local political elite, and how those particular governance arrangements are propped up by an international political elite. Whether this is sold to us under the guise of preventing terrorism or dealing with migration issues, the need to have safer, secure countries and uh, you know, across the border zones so that we can prevent the movement of people from Africa into Europe. You know, we, we are aware that uh, all of this discourse around terrorism, all of this discourse around stable and secure uh, countries is underwritten by the desire and the need for international political elite in collusion with local political elite to sustain governance arrangements that benefit them and not those that benefit the vast majority of the citizens in those countries. We are also aware as a result of that, that people's agency and their voice through the vote, the dad that we have been sold, elections, regular elections, you vote for people, parties with manifestos, have become a dad. They have become a performance that we all go to every five years, four years, depending on what arrangement you have in your country. But your agency as a voter, as a citizen has completely been taken away from you because the decisions around who is sitting in your state house or in your parliament is largely determined by other actors. And here we're talking about state actors, but we're also talking about private and international capital. I think all of us who are sitting on this webinar are by now completely familiar with the Cambridge Analytica and the ways in which it has intervened in a range of, of, of different electoral processes, the ways in which the technological platforms that we've become so used to using and the data that we willingly submit as part of our, uh, our need to connect across different uh, borders has become manipulated and mobilized for the interests of global capital, for the interest of international and local elite. So we subscribe to elections, we subscribe to going to vote, and we are threatened with peace uh, in, uh, as part of the process of trying to ensure that we do not resort to other means of renegotiating the social contract because the ways in which we have been uh, uh, sold the, the, that the social contract should be negotiated through democracy and through elections is no longer working for the vast majority. But what has been evident in the African continent, and we have seen it in Sudan with the ouster of Bashir, in Burkina Faso with the ouster of Kompaori, Ben Ali in Tunisia, Mubarak in Egypt, is that citizens are tired, citizens are rising, and as citizens are not complacent, uh, are not willing to sit back and simply allow this farce of elections and voting to be the, the, the core mechanism around which their futures and their realities are determined. I made this central point around governance arrangements, around ideas about democratization, election, and voting as part of a process of pointing out that what we see today with your Boris Johnsons, with your uh, Donald Trumps, with the, with the anger that is being witnessed uh, in, you know, in, the, in the countries in the global north about democracy and voice are things that we have been witnessing in other parts of the world for a very long time. Now, the narrative that has shaped our experiences of lack of democratic practices is one that has been wrapped up in this idea that there are cultural faults, right? There are racial and cultural faults that make particular countries non-democratic and others more democratic than others. So what does democratization look like in this particular moment of COVID-19 for those sitting in the global north? They're acutely aware that those in office in these very democratic countries that I'm sitting in, for instance, right now, as part of this webinar, are not responding to their needs. They're more responsive to the needs of global capital and the needs of the very few political elite at the heart or at the center of these governance arrangements. So that's the first central point that I want to make. The second connected point con uh, you know, concerns the collision of gender equality and ideas around gender and sexuality and the ways in which they've been manipulated by fascist movements. Now, one of the things that we've become acutely aware of, and when I say we, I'm talking about feminist analysts, feminist activists, 
who are observing these shifts around the world is that the questions of gender and sexuality have been absolutely pivotal and central to how fascist movements are organizing and mobilizing. And in fact, what it has done is provide us with a way to push back against this narrative that has often been easy to use as a counter argument in the public domain, that when people are challenging uh, uh, ideas around homophobia, or when particular narratives around the persecution of queer folk or the persecution of women's rights or the, the, the sort of withdrawal of women's rights in specific countries, that those efforts by specific governments are opportunistic activities or measures that are being taken by government to, to, to sort of prevent a, a larger and much more important discussions about questions such as grant corruption or questions such as, uh, uh, you know, um, bad elections, for instance. But what the fascist movements are telling us one second, Avino, would you mind speaking a tiny bit slower for the interpreters? And uh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. What we are observing with fascist movements is the fact that gender and sexuality is absolutely central to the ways in which they think about the organization of society. So that old argument that feminists have made for the longest time, that gender makes the world go around, is becoming very evident. So gender and sexuality, the targeting of women human rights defenders, the targeting of queer folk is not accidental. It's part and parcel of the process of the ways in which fascist movements and far right groups are rethinking the nature of the state. The conservative ideas, the ultra nationalist ideas that are being pursued by these groups are fundamentally informed and shaped by very conservative ideas, binary ideas of gender, very conservative ideas about sexuality. So in terms of the feminist work that we need to do around reframing our own uh, activism around questions of women's rights, reframing the ways in which queer politics has sort of been uh, co-opted into larger, if you will, sort of homo-nationalist ideas about, you know, we will give you some rights and we are accepting you as part of this larger fabric of society. We are being asked as activists, as thinkers, to, to turn these logics of how we have entered spaces of advocacy upside down. We are being asked to go back to the very foundational feminist ideas that we have sort of uh, pursued for a very long time through our writing and through our activism, which is to argue that gender and sexuality is absolutely central to how our societies function. And the minute that there's resistance and subversion to very conservative ideas around gender and sexuality, all of this, um, all of the ways in which our societies are structured unravels. And that's why the disciplining of women's bodies, the disciplining of queer folk, the disciplining of women human rights defenders through their disappearance, their death and persecution becomes an important strategy for these groups. The third and final point I want to make concerns, about, concerns alternative visions for society. And this is something that Tithi has picked up on, so I don't want to speak too much about it. I will just make one central point and leave space for others to build on it. I am a gender and conflict scholar. And if you read that broad range of literature, thinking about the transformation of societies during moments of conflict, Part of the argument that we have always made is that situations of conflict provide a window. It's a tiny window, but there is a window during that moment of moving from situation of conflict to moving to a peaceful situation of transforming, rewiring the ways in which societies think about uh, gendered ideas of our society. This COVID-19 moment in my view provides that window. Now, what are the ways in which as scholars, as activists, as people interested in visions of society that are grounded in notions of freedom, equality, and justice, how do we grab this window? Because it's often very small, it's often very narrow, and the opportunity for it to close very quickly comes before we even can blink. In my view, I think it is important, and this is a reminder that we are sort of uh, being pushed to think about very critically at this moment, is around transnational solidarity. And in my view, this is not about isolated pockets of work that, is, that occurs in different parts of the globe. I think this is the moment really for stronger efforts across different parts of the global south. Uh, 
stronger narrative building, stronger activist related work within various parts of the global south that connects us towards a centralized narrative of change, transformation, justice, and freedom, away from an isolated approach of thinking about this as something that can only be thought about within the African continent or within the subcontinent of India or within Latin America, for instance. I know I've not been very kind to the translators. I apologize for that, but I'll leave it uh, here for now. Thanks, Lavinia. Thank you so much, Avino. That was, that was really extremely important to hear, um, these reflections on, on state and corporate actors and, and um, yeah, the anti-gender politics um, um, kind of as a result um, and underpinning uh, these fundamentalist uh, movements. So let me now uh, welcome Cara Jabola Karolis. Um, Kara is executive director of the Hawaii State Commission of the Status of Women, a government agency in the United States. She's also co-founder of Affirm Hawaii, the Association of Feminists Fighting Fascism, Imperialism, Refeudalization and Marginalization, and author of Hawaii's Feminist Economic Recovery Plan for COVID-19. Kara, uh, would you... Uh, could you tell us about Hawaii's feminist economic recovery plan and speak about the extent to which working from within the state is effective in order to radically transform democracy and create new feminist realities? And it would also be great to hear a bit about how feminist groups around the world can push for such processes in their own country. So over to you, Kara. Thank you. Aloha and good morning, everybody. So I'm going to be offering an inside government perspective. Um, TT gave a kind of harsh introduction of uh, government, but I'm not going to I'm not going to defend um, the settler colonial state, but rather talk about um, some of the ways that that women and the movements are interacting with government. So a little bit of the backstory of Hawaii. Um, usually, when I uh, mention that I'm based in Honolulu and um, working from Hawaii that elicits oohs and ahs. Um, but Hawaii is a settler colonial state that um, has had a long history of devastating impacts of infectious diseases um, brought by foreigners. And the most impacted have always been um, indigenous or native Hawaiian women. Um, so with that in mind today, fast forwarding, um, Hawaii has been largely rendered um, unlivable because of the ravages of this tourist trap that we are in, luxury development and militarism that define our economy. And um, I am situated within the government at the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women. Um, for folks outside of the US or maybe even folks within the US, um, most states have a commission on the status of women. Um, it's kind of a tool that was left by feminists in the 1960s as something that they thought might be able to help us um, advance the movement in some way. And so each state um, has a commission, almost every state, and to the extent that they are feminist really depends on their politics and also the laws governing them. But um, ours is feminist in Hawaii and we are mandated to be a watchdog for women and engage in politics. Um, so for me, we are the first and oldest in the United States. Um, and for me, I kind of like to think of myself as your midwife. So of all the scholars and um, thinkers and feelers here on the call, being a midwife to your ideas and also the theory building coming from our communities. Um, we work as kind of the main policy consultant for elected officials and government heads, what have you. Um, but also we're a pain receptor for women in our state. And I think that's really important because even though we produce research and data, um, a lot of that is not being captured by the state. And so having a really trusting relationship to the movement and to activists is really important. Um, so a little bit about the plan and how it was made. We, um, you know, of course are all witnessing the global rise of fascism and in Hawaii in particular, um, our political class feels like this juggernaut of capitalism coming at us during this crisis to return us to the old normal as quickly as it possibly can. Um, and so 
what we decided to do as a commission was try to counteract that the best that we could um, and also model a community-based participatory process um, you know at this time and show that there's really no excuse to not be doing that if a group of um, you know moms and um, working class women as well as scholars as well as healthcare workers and social workers and service providers can do it in a week then surely anyone can um, and so that's what we did so we brought together a group of um, diverse women centering those most impacted so i think some of the common threads that we had together um, are being colonized women um, so Native women, transnational women, um, who find very little answers in Western feminism and very little hope in incrementalist solutions. And we also have um, a shared understanding of the trauma of um, Western colonization and how the pandemic and the ways that our communities are suffering from it traces to Western colonization um, and land loss. And also, you know, the, the value of land and women as a global commodity. And so, um, you know, some of us were more consolidated in our analysis, others were not, but we put together a team, um, a feminist um, COVID re response team initially um, that was, meant to provide a rapid response and respond to the responses. So anything from um, autonomous resourcing, so-called mutual aid, to um, assisting each other with advocacy because every single state edict that has come out in Hawaii has not factored in women. And so we have had to basically try to correct it. Um, for example, uh, women fleeing domestic violence get caught up in an inter-island travel quarantine. We're in an archipelago here. Um, and that was never considered. And so we see that have a, a, a really devastating effect um, on certain people's lives. But back to our group, um, we were doing a lot of response to the here and now, and we still are. Um, but in the midst of that, we of course saw our state positioning to define the future and define it very quickly and not in an engaging process with the community. And so, um, we decided to put together a feminist economic recovery plan. Um, it took us about a week and um, we tried to, we, well, first of all, we were explicitly feminist because we want to reverse white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Um, it wasn't just a label we put on. We didn't, we were incredibly intentional about using um, the, the term feminist and the history that we were carrying with us. Um, we tried to answer four questions that every state um, will have to face. So where are you get, gonna get the money from to bail people out um, and the government out? Um, how are you gonna stimulate jobs? What should we do um, with all this federal money? And how, if you could, would you restructure the economy to be more resilient? Um, and I know my office got those questions as just part of our um, government mandate to answer to our legislature. And I only had four hours to answer them. And that's really what, what sparked us to answer them as a group and to come up with a document. And for us, it was really important to reframe the conversation from talking about inclusion and equality in this system to liberation, especially at a moment when we're seeing so many people in Hawaii including behind um, the scenes. I'll tell you, like in, in government meetings, it's a trip because um, you'll hear like seasoned bureaucrats actually critique capitalism and say the word capitalism, shredding it. And it's, it's very surreal. Um, and so, you know, pushing that radicalization. And so um, for, for us and for me, I'm not here in this role um, to transform the government. Um, I'm here to transform culture and I just happen to be in this role and I'm using it um, and pushing it as far as I can. And so with this plan, um, we really wanted to focus again on reorienting our economy away from militarism, tourism, 
destructive industries, luxury development, um, to end these industries and get women out of them um, and lay the foundation for that. So I think one of the most important parts was to first heal and repair harm to Native Hawaiians, the indigenous people of Hawaii. So we wanted to make sure 20% um, of federal funding went to them. Um, and that is just this very start. You know, a, a couple of the key features of the plan are to scale up the social safety net, which is women's lifeline to survival, to untie basic necessities and foundational care from work, to harness caregiving. I think that, you know, um, we've had a couple of speakers already speak to that, the importance of that, and, um, you know, species, species essential work. Um, to, to revalue women and revalue our role. Um, we also talked about um, things like maternal care and how, I mean, I remember when I gave birth recently and in the past, it, it, it's all, it was almost better, um, a better experience taking a pet to the veterinarian. So there are huge needs from women and our economy is not based on obviously any needs, but certainly not the needs of women. And so these were all some of the guiding features of our, our plan, but I'm reaching time. And I, I think the last question was, you know, how would, how can states um, replicate this or individuals or organizations? And I think, you know, number one, right, Google Docs, it's just live time participatory for those who have tech, tech access and also working with activists who um, can really be, in a relationship with you that trust you um, to put this forward and work with the state on it. Um, but I have just been really grateful that we've had this opportunity and I hope that it sparks more conversation, but I'll leave it at that. Mahalo, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Kara. That was really great. So I think, um, Jess, would you like to put the next slide on? Um, yes, there we go. It's great. I just to say I have a Linux computer. So that means that with zoom, I always face a few small issues, but we're getting there. So there we go. Um, yes, uh, this was really inspiring. Um, and uh, now we will move to Laura Roth. So Laura is a lecturer of legal and political philosophy at Universidad Oberta de Catalunya, Barcelona. She's also an activist in the municipalist movement, member of MINIM, Municipalist Observatory, and author of the practice-oriented report, Feminist Politics Now. And I would like to ask you, uh, Laura, as feminists, what are the new radical possibilities of democracy, political cooperation, and governance that we can imagine? Uh, what are some examples of existing forms of radical feminist democracy, whether outside or inside the state that we see emerge? And finally, how can our movements act on the current crisis and nurture feminist forms of democracy and governance that are tr truly transformational? Um, so, Thank you already. Uh, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to speak after the, the great previous interventions and actually some of the things I'm going to share uh, today are going to be related um, to that. So, um, what I will try to do is, um, it's, uh, it's probably um, a different style of intervention now. I'm going to try suggesting new ways of, of um, dealing with, uh, with, um, with politics and new possibilities um, for feminism in politics. And um, I think the, the, these possibilities um, come from a combination of feminist and municipalist practices that are already taking place in many cities and towns in different continents. And I want to suggest that we should start uh, shifting our focus uh, from states towards cities and towns and towards local politics to find some answers to both to this crisis, but also to, to the deeper problems that have been 
mentioned before. Um, and, and I believe that municipalism and feminism are great allies in this project because um, both of them want to change the way politics is done and, and not only what is done through politics. And this is key to achieve uh, global change. So um, you might wonder why speaking about this now, why, why speaking about municipalism and local politics? It doesn't seem to be the best moment to, um, to shift our focus to the small things. It seems that we're dealing with a big problem, right? Big answers. Um, and and uh, the pandemic shows um, uh, a trend towards centralization, top-down decision-making, militarized discourses in many countries. And um, why would anyone propose to decentralize, give up power, to share it with communities and social movements? Um, maybe in this, uh, of course, in this conversation, some of the, of the issues that we are uh, suggesting and the responses that we are suggesting go in that direction. But for many people, these are times where, um, where we are afraid. We, did, we tend to give up our freedoms. We tend to worry a bit less about who is deciding, deciding and, and how they are deciding. We are, um, we are afraid that, uh, th that the, if they don't make the right decisions, it will impact us in our communities, right? So it seems that it's not, um, uh, that it's times where, where uh, and in crisis in general, uh, seem to be times where people are, are more willing to, to trust experts and trust others, right? Um, nevertheless, uh, this crisis has also showed um, that, um, that municipalism has a great potential to deal with, with really big problems and deep problems. Um, as you, of course, know, community responses uh, have been multiplying uh, in many places, and uh, local governments are also the ones uh, that have been dealing with, the, with many of the practical and complex consequences of the pandemic and also of the confinement and, and dealing with the impact that this has had on many people. Uh, they, both communities and local governments, have been the ones sustaining relationships, taking care of the vulnerable, making daily life possible for many people. Uh, and also paying attention to those who are uh, on many occasions invisible uh, for the state and for, for big institutions, not only the state, but also um, uh, uh, transnational uh, institutions. So, um, yeah, I want to suggest that, um, that looking at municipalism can offer some, some answers, uh, both to the crisis, as I said, but also to, to uh, deeper and, and long-term problems. And, but first, why, what do we mean by municipalism here, right? There's, there's different versions and, and it seems to have, it, it has become a word that many people are using um, in different senses. Um, and here, I, I will be talking about one of those versions. Uh, uh, some people connect this to the fearless cities movement. Some people connect this to to the term new, new municipalism. And um, the the point now is that it's not connected to simply more at autonomy to cities and towns to decide what's best, uh, but to change um, to change the way politics is done. And it's a political strategy that aims at building power from the bottom up. Um, but also at um, making collaboration possible between social movements, communities, and local governments. And also, it's connected to um, changing those local institutions in order to make them, um, to, to blur those borders between what's outside and what's inside, and what's public also and what's private. And it's also connected to strong forms of democracy. Um, I'm not talking about something uh, simply uh, ideal. Uh, this is something that, that is being um, experimented in many parts of the world. Um, in the case of Spain, for instance, you, many of, those, of you probably know that in 2015, many uh, citizen platforms won the local elections and they, um, they tried to implement uh, this type of municipalism. Uh, and they even won the biggest cities in, in across, the, across the Spanish state. Um, and the project was connected not only to, um, 
winning and doing um, implementing new policies that were more democratic, feminist, and, and better for those uh, most vulnerable, but also changing the way politics was done. And the spirit of this was also connected to the 15N movement that was criticizing traditional politics. So um, I have the feeling that some of the challenges that we are facing um, uh, now uh, in, this, in this pandemic have made um, more evident the need that we have to change politics and not, not the, so the way politics is done and not only what we do through politics. Uh, we see an incapacity of traditional representative politics to engage people. Um, and Avino was mentioning before some of those features, right? Uh, also the incapacity of states to face global problems, rise of uh, right-wing populism in many places. And those, those, um, uh, those parties are, are usually able to mobilize people. So how, how do we address that problem and how can we engage people and bring them back to politics and, and um, give them um, an interest and uh, yeah, generate an interest in politics and not simply do what's best for them, right? Um, and then also there's, um, there's a, a left-wing populism that uh, is being adv advocated in many places. Um, and this is not a discussion that uh, we can have um, here, but um, there's also many problems with, with a feminist uh, view um, of, so from a feminist point of view with those kinds of projects that are not really able to change uh, how politics works. Um, so now going to, to more, um, uh, to more concrete, um, to the more concrete discussion. So how can our movements uh, uh, act through feminist forms of democracy? That was Lavinia's questions, a question. Um, so I think, as I was saying before, that feminism and municipalism can reinforce each other in changing the way politics is done. Uh, they both aim at um, building power from the bottom up and not um, trusting existing structures because they only reproduce existing privileges. They both uh, want to treat uh, people as subjects and not simply objects of politics. Um, and uh, they both uh, aim at um, recognizing the complexity of some of the problems that we are dealing with. It's not simply a matter of uh, um, uh, concrete policies or uh, economic responses to the crisis. The, the impacts of this of this crisis goes, goes far beyond and it impacts our lives and our relationships in, in very complex ways. And um, so in practice, what, what does this mean? Um, as I was saying before, it doesn't simply mean um, focusing on the local level and implementing feminist policies or things like that. It doesn't mean bringing more women into politics because that won't change politics um, alone. Uh, so we need to think about how can we implement new ways of, of doing politics and what does that, that mean? And, and how can this, uh, and why this it can impact our, our um, our uh, political environment. So um, we've been doing some research within the municipalist movement in many places and gathering practices and, and discussions that are happening there and, and uh, on the ground. Um, and uh, we've been, we gathered those in a report that um, is probably going to be shared. Um, and some of the issues that we have been paying attention were uh, first of all, um, when we are thinking about gender equality, not thinking simply about having more women in politics, but also um, uh, sharing the responsibilities in different ways in a, in a broad sense, sharing caring responsibilities, for instance, um, uh, sharing visibility and, and many other things. Uh, but also, and more importantly, perhaps, um, trying to develop new forms of leadership that are not infallible, not, um, not 
uh, top down that can work leaders can become part of the teams and um, and leadership can become something collective um, there's there's many practical suggestions of how to do this in that report that I was mentioning before um, then another important issue is um, how how we can build um, uh, new forms of, of power, how can we exercise power in a new way? Uh, not, not power over people, not something that we take from others when we, when we exercise power, but something that we exercise with others uh, and collectively. Um, then another important issue is um, politics needs to change the way we speak and we talk about issues. Um, and we and the, what the municipalist movement has been trying to implement is from a feminist perspective perspective going away from confrontative uh, winner takes all discourses and um, where the aim is to destroying others right and to um, yeah to shift to more more collective uh, discourses that that can um, resemble more how communities usually um, usually speak and usually um, address their their problems and then another element is participatory democracy there's a lot of work uh, not only in the municipalist movement but also in other in other um, domains about this um, and then so here the aim is both for participatory democracy in general but also for from a feminist perspective the aim is to um, implement horizontal decision making uh, mechanisms that uh, can break the privileges that we have in usually in politics and decision making so it's not um, um, yeah it's not simply opening the but but it's not simply opening decision making but having structures that incentivize um, uh, decentralized decision making and that may generate diverse ways of engaging people in politics so that everyone can participate and also making clear where decisions are made and not simply uh, trusting informal decision making mechanisms that mechanisms that usually tend to favor those with who already have uh, privileges in our societies and finally of course this is a this is always a relevant issue care uh, so a central issue in in a feminist way of doing politics uh, is is uh, putting care at the center of our practices and this means not only care for dependent beings and and paying attention to all the, the care work that is, is already being done and um, and making this um, a collective responsibility a public issue uh, also distributing that uh, care work more evenly in our societies, but also care in the relationships in politics, uh, bringing care into every discourse, every practice, um, and uh, in political relations. So that's another dimension of care. And finally, self-care. Um, at least in the municipalist movement, experience has shown that um, doing politics is terrible for for um, individual real individuals um, and the experience in in many of these citizen platforms that won the elections in Spain but also um, representatives uh, in many other places show that um, it is very difficult to engage with institutional um, machines without uh, bodies suffering uh, and 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 confronting a, uh, and paying a very high cost at the personal level. So sh politics should be something that everyone should do and um, everyone should be able to do. So yeah, so that's the last um, last point. There's many practical tools in that report I was mentioning, uh, and of course um, the discussion is much much broader. Um, but Sorry, Laura. It here. Super, this was really amazing. Um, and um, thanks for these very rich reflections um, to hear about the growing feminist municipalist movement um, and how we can truly kind of democratize, transform how we do politics. Um, so reflecting on these four contributions, it's to hear on the one end how COVID has been deepening many interests 
expect the diversity of women that are as acting as workers, carers, frontline defenders, and many more roles. And on the other hand, how feminist forces are already finding ways to cooperate, organize, and govern in, in much more democratic ways. Um, so now I would like to give the floor to fellow Jean Anumo of AWIT, um, because they recently kicked off a very exciting feminist bailout campaign. Uh, just to briefly introduce you, fellow Jean is a pan-African feminist activist who co-leads AWIT's Building Feminist Economies program. So, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much and um, thanks to all the lovely speakers who provide really an excellent segue for how we um, were thinking about the co-creating the feminist bailout campaign. Now the idea to plan uh, the feminist bailout campaign emerged as soon as the scope and the scale of the COVID crisis um, began to push corporations to align quite closely around bailout uh, demands. And so some of the campaigns that also emerged around this time had a rallying call bailout the people um, not the corporations. Now, this is a very critical message at this moment, but we also know, like some of our speakers have mentioned, that when people hear this, not everyone thinks of all the women, trans and gender diverse folks holding this economy. Neither do they think about the powerful solutions feminists have been developing for years. And so the aim of the bail feminist bailout campaign is really to interconnect feminist solutions and proposals as parts of a comprehensive economic recovery agenda that is feminist and that is global. For us at EWID, the feminist bailout campaign builds on what we call feminist realities, which is the solutions and alternatives um, that we are looking for already exist in the now, in the ways that we live, in the struggles and building our lives and communities. Connected to this and, and part of the co-creation plan, last week we had a series of planning calls in English, French and Spanish where over 1,000 feminist collectives, organizations, and individuals joined to plan for a series of coordinated actions for the campaign. And so beginning next week, that is from June 1st to June 5th, we'll hold a global virtual street rally in the form of an action week. And during this week, we'll be connecting existing campaigns and amplifying existing messaging under the umbrella of feminist bailout. In this, we will call attention to feminist solutions around key themes such as climate justice, bodily autonomy, governance, resourcing, racial and economic justice, um, for example. The main point here is for us to demonstrate our collective power in this key moment so that our di diverse demands are better seen, heard, and taken on board. Um, the game changer of COVID-19 story is not what we are living now, but what happens on the day after tomorrow. And I think uh, Dr. Kitch has even pointed us the fact that the narrow window and really short-lived window and what can we do within this window. And so what we hope that through the campaign is that we can shape the direction of change towards policies and ultimately the ones that will shape our future and our life. As all the speakers have ably pointed out, uh, we are facing a new reality and we have the imperative to shape it as a feminist reality. Ultimately, Lavinia, what we hope is that the feminist bailout will provide a platform to build and strengthen transnational solidarity, but most importantly, to reframe our feminist imagination and center feminist economies as the solution and not an alternative. So I hope everybody can sign on. I think the link has been shared on the chat box. Thank you, Lavinia. Well, thanks a lot. That was uh, great and yeah, Hopefully, we'll all converge again. We are now with um, um, over 800 uh, folks, so hopefully we'll all mobilize again um, in those days that you mentioned. Um, so let me go to some of the questions that we received. Thanks a lot for everyone who, who uh, put those questions in. Um, let's see. Um, Titi, can I ask you the first question? Um, Considering what you have said about the responses of the state, how do you see the relationship between states and capitalism? Um, and what do you think of the care income that was uh, proposed by many, uh, among with the global women's strike? So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Right, okay, well, thanks. And you know, this was such an amazing panel. Thank you so much for uh, bringing, putting this together. So I want to talk about capitalism and the state. Um, so, you know, if we think back on the early days of capitalism as it developed in parts of the global north, for instance, uh, Britain, 
um, initially the drive for profit making was um, pure, like it wasn't mitigated by anything. So, you know, we have uh, reports from early uh, British working class people, uh, how their lives were in the sense that um, entire families, women and children worked in these um, industries, um, worked, you know, 12 to 14 hour days. Um, and also to be remembered that the um, original funding for such industries, the way that Manchester could develop into an industrial capitalist um, uh, center was because the money came from slave trade. And so th those two are intimately connected. So the lives of um, people uh, stolen uh, from Africa were completely disregarded and combined with that were the lives of uh, uh, families, working class families in the centers of imperial power were also completely disregarded. So if this went on, then, you know, there would be no workers left to actually produce profit. So it was, uh, as usual, capitalism is a short term vision system, which only looks at profit. But as I said before, it is also dependent on working lives. So one of the institutions that stepped in, in a way, to, to um, regulate, not to abolish profit, but to regulate profit is the capitalist state. So the state plays this particular function under capitalism, which is it tries to regulate profits such that profit can be ongoing. So. Um, one of the things that happened, I think, um, under neoliberalism in the last 40 years is, you know, people often said that this was uh, the, the state withdrew and markets dominated. OK, but for those of us from the global south and especially um, uh, people of color, even in the global north, know that in 40 years of neoliberalism, the state actually did not withdraw. Uh, in fact, immigration borders um, were hardened. Uh, there were more police in neighborhoods shooting people indiscriminately. So, but what did happen then is that the social reproduction functions of the state were stripped. So all public funding for health, education, etc., those functions of the state were stripped, while the carceral functions of the state were escalated, right? So the state plays this double, capitalist states play this double role in the system. On the one hand, it guarantees or tries to guarantee uh, the reproduction of life. And on the other hand, it militarizes and um, in a way, guarantees death making as well in the same in the same way. And when I say it tries to guarantee life making, I want to be very clear that it guarantees life making in disproportionate ways, in the sense that some lives are always valued more than others. OK, and you you need not just look into the United States to see the discriminate killings of um, black people in this country. You can look to my country, India, and see the discriminate killings of Dalit people. You can look to all countries for the discriminate um, undervaluing of the life of women, migrants, and trans people, right? So, so it is valuing life in order to keep profit going, but valuing life in a particular way to actually um, prop up heteronormative families, to prop up racialized uh, social logics, right? So that's the role of the state. But it is also true that the state, we can make certain demands of the state of the state that we cannot make in a sense for to you know like private industries in that sense because our public taxes also prop up the state so till we get to an ideal socialist society uh, we do try to pressure the state you know uh, to to shift its priorities from profit making and carceral priorities to life-making priorities. We can demand that we need more hospitals and schools and less uh, uh, drones and prisons. We can demand that Jeff Bezos be taxed in order to uh, 
for those hospitals and schools to be uh, built uh, all over the country. So those kind of demands can be made of the uh, capitalist state, but we cannot depend on the capitalist state to give us those things. This is why movements on the ground, movements of the marginalized are absolutely vital to move the priorities of the state. Thank you so much. That was um, a very rich answer, Titi. Um, so now I have a question for Avino. Um, it's, a, it's a big one. <laughs> um, so you already went, went very deep. Um, and so there's the question to go even deeper um, in terms of how can we analyze and support real internationalism and coordinated anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-homophobic movements. So how do we drip, uh, how, we, how do we bridge gaps between North and South? Uh, what would stronger solidarity look like in concrete terms? Um, it would be really great to hear a, a f yeah, in a few minutes a bit about those questions. Thank mm. you. Thanks, thanks, Lavinia. It's a, it's a big question, but I also think it's an easy question. And the reason why I say it's easy is because there are very many of our feminist comrades who are on this webinar at the moment who've been doing this work, right? So what does it mean to build true international solidarity? We have seen the sort of uh, very groundbreaking leading work that feminist funds, for instance, in particular, have been doing around you know, providing support to movements that is based less on project and program-based funding, but that is supporting the strategic needs and initiatives that are emerging in the context within which they work. For me, that is one way and, and very practical evidence of how we have seen a move away from global feminist ideas that position those in the global north because they're the holders of the past strings as the determinants of the agendas and the initiatives that are happening in other parts of the world, right? So funding for me is, I always, you know, crack this joke in the classroom is reparations. So for me, the central argument here is that you're giving back resources that were taken away for most of this context and that those who are in this context should determine the ways in which that, that money is used. And feminist funds are doing this work. Your Mama Cash's, your Urgent Action Funds, uh, the Global Fund for Women, you know, multiple, multiple feminist funds, including those that are located on the African continent, uh, such as the African Women's Development Fund, for example. The second thing that I think is important for us, uh, you know, to, to foreground is the question of how to build effective allyship and how to ensure that those who are feeling the pinch in real terms, those who are, are sitting with the pain of the ways in which our, uh, the structures of our societies are built and are sustained, actually lead from the front. And I think it is in this complicated terrain of being able to step back and act as an ally, to recognize the ways in which your privileges, you know, position you slightly differently in terms of how you can have conversations, the spaces you can enter, the kinds of support that you're able to offer, and allow you know, the sort of autonomous organizing by people of color, black people, Africans, you know, queer folk, you know, to enable those autonomous spaces to occur without us consistently descending into this particular argument that we are all suffering because we are not in, in this together. Let, I think we need to be clear about that, right? The ways in which we are experiencing COVID-19 and other structural inequalities that preceded this particular moment are not felt in the same way. And autonomous organizing, in my view, is a critical part of recognizing this inequality of experiences and impact. It's also the space within which we can allow people to, to regroup, to think, to heal, to care for themselves, as, 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 uh, as Laura was pointing out, without necessarily needing to consistently be careful about what you're saying, to educate, to, to make people feel welcome in a space that is about re-nourishing your strategies of, of, of collective and feminist organizing. Again, autonomous organizing of, I will use the word because it's the one that is easily available to me now, marginalized groups has existed for a very long time and this kind of work has surfaced much more strongly uh, uh, during this particular moment in terms of the ways in which communities have, res have responded uh, in relation to funding initiatives, in relation to care and support uh, within local communities. But this is a tricky conversation around allyship and solidarity that it's painful, it's tricky, but we must continue to have it and recognize that if we're actually going to build meaningful international solidarity, then we must put 
all of these difficult and painful conversations on the table without descending into uh, you know, these generalized ideas that um, when we talk about capitalism or when we talk about um, white supremacy, I'm talking about you as a white person. I'm talking about the system. I'm not attacking you as an individual. We're talking about the structural system that generates these, in these inequalities. Now, I saw in the chat there was a very, a, a very specific question around how do we build transnational solidarity when countries are reigning in? You know, the, the, the borders are closing. Uh, our abilities to, to connect in physical ways is, is now being impeded and, and sort of being uh, ramped up. You know, governments who have, uh, have wanted to close borders are now using COVID-19 as, as a, a sort of mechanism to, you know, to prop up uh, their exclusionary policies. I think that we must recognize that in this day and age, um, that while it is important for us to have those tactile, physical moments of solidarity and, and, and engagement and connect our struggles uh, in, in physical ways, what COVID-19 has taught us in very practical terms is that transnational solidarity can also occur uh, without us needing to be physically in each other's spaces. With, uh, and there are multiple uh, uh, examples that I'm sure folks have been sharing in the chat that illustrate how uh, you know, activists in different parts of you know, the Caucasus, the northern, uh, you know, other parts of Europe, or thinking about uh, different parts of the African continent, have been able to work with each other without being um, uh, be beholden to this idea that the only way we can organize is when we attend a workshop or do a conference. Right, uh, and, and, and it's these logics, these NGOized logics around the ways in which we build solidarity that uh, are being challenged at this moment. And I think it offers a wonderful opportunity to, to break out of, of how our feminist movement got captured by um, the development agenda and the NGO logic. I think this is also the perfect opportunity to think about movement building outside of the prison of NGOs. I, I just want to close by underscoring that I'm aware that a lot of the answers to these questions lie with the activists and those who are on the front line of movements that are seated within this webinar. And so what I'm offering are really just broad uh, sort of pointers to some of the work that I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with. Thank you. Thank you a lot um, for raising all these extremely urgent um, issues uh, with building transnational solidarity. Um, so now um, I want to uh, ask the same question to both Laura and Kara. So just to read it out, uh, thank you for the people who put this in. Um, the changes you have discussed here are already very deep. So how can we bring about this kind of cultural change, especially across many national and political differences? Um, and maybe if you can weave some of the successful community level responses in that we have been seeing in these different contexts. Um, if it possible, please uh, stick to two minutes so that we don't run into overtime too much. Thank you. Um, maybe, Kara, would you like to go first? Sure. There are a lot of ways to shift the culture. I mean, you know, some people advocate for legal change to set the tone and send a clear message from the government and other, you know, other folks um, emphasize community education. I think um, one of the examples that I can give you from the State Commission on the Status of Women um, is that when I entered office, it was kind of jarring, I think, to, to some folks because I shifted away from um, a heavy or primary focus just on policymaking and more on community education. And so we undertook a systemic um, training and there have been hundreds of government workers, uh, prosecutors, social workers, health workers, um, professors, students who've undergone um, a course that is called Unlearning Patriarchy. Um, and I think that there are ways to, because I mean, a lot of the, of the reasons why people are so hostile to the proposals and don't understand them. I mean, you know, I go to the legislature and people don't believe that there's a, um, a gender wage gap and there's no way you can convince them that it exists. So we have to really do a lot more of the educating in a way that um, ties into empathy and storytelling and you know any space that can happen in. And we're just one example of how we've tried to do that in government to create the conditions 
um, where people understand the plight of women, um, femme identified and non-binary people. And um, I th yeah, that's just, that's just one of, of many answers to this, but um, thank you again for the platform um, to share. Great, thank you. Please, Laura, uh, great to hear from you. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, um, there, there's probably lots of possibilities, right? Uh, and, and it's a complex phenomenon, how culture changes. Uh, it's not something that you can, um, uh, there's no, there's no magic, uh, magic solution here. But um, I would like to point out, um, point out one of them, uh, which is uh, giving people a voice and trusting them to to do that change themselves. Uh, people learn um, by becoming part of processes and by taking responsibility. Um, so it's um, I I don't like thinking about this in terms of educating people first and then asking them to take part, but uh, but uh, as a as a, something that happens together. Um, and uh, I think having a more democratic culture uh, happens by uh, implementing democracy and experiencing democracy in practice and this is much easier to do at the local level this is why why um also i think um changing politics from from the local level is is um is important because it's um it's a much better way to engage people um in a meaningful way uh, that is connected to their lives, to their experiences, and where they can have a real, um, a real practice of democracy and that, that can shift uh, their culture. There's lots of studies that show that these things, uh, not only at the local level, but that having people participate in democratic decision-making changes their democratic culture. Um, this, there's studies about deliberative democracy, about juries, about many, in many dimensions, uh, in many, sorry, areas. Um, so I think if I had to choose one, I would stay, stick to that one. Wow, thank you, um, Laura. And um, yeah, it has been so rich to hear from you, to learn from all of you. So a very big thanks to, to all the speakers um, and everyone who joined us, who participated in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, and uh, let me also thank the whole TNI team for their great organizational support. Um, so Katie and Satoko behind the scenes, and of course, Jess, uh, Nick. Let me also thank um, Omera, Ahmad, Noreen, Shamim, Shamim of AWIT, who also worked hard to shape this webinar. Um, and of course, also thank you to the co-sponsors. Um, we will find, uh, you will find in the chat their websites and we suggest you consult them as their work covers a very rich range of the issues we discussed today related to transforming democracy and building feminist realities. And we also would like to encourage you to join next week's webinar um, on uh, the global fight against mass incarceration, which was also um, actually spoken about uh, today. Um, so let me go back and I'll see a beautiful slide. Um, and at this webinar, we'll hear from Olivia, Olivia Rope, Isabel Pereira and Sabrina Matani, who will discuss um, civil society strategies to reverse the long-standing trend of mass incarceration as a response to crime. So you can register um, via our website, you see in the, in the chat. And other webinars um, of June will be about big tech, data and human rights on June 10. And on June 17, we will address borders and migration. Um, and TNI is committed to keep organizing webinars as global learning spaces to connect progressive communities. And if you find our work valuable, uh, thank you for considering a donation. Your support is tremendously helpful to keep us going. So thanks once again for joining us and we will leave the chat open for another five minutes so you can wrap up your conversations there. And we hope to see you next time. And yes, thanks again to everyone who contributed to today. <laughs>